puppy, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, now that we've uh, traded our our pet <laughs> our pet occupant patients, um, our pet ownership, I should say, over here, <laughs> we can get to the meat of this. Uh, so, welcome back to another episode of System of Systems by Safety Propaganda. This is your host, Adam Lehrer, and I have a very special guest with us tonight. This is an artist I've long been familiar with, but only recently uh, had the chance to meet due to your recent exhibition at my friend Raph's gallery, Newton. Nevertheless, this is the man, New York legend, Stephen <laughs> Tunney, also known by his uh, musician, his, pro uh, his rock and roll projects named Dog Bowl. Nevertheless, Stephen, how are you tonight? Nice to meet you here in uh, in the Zoom world, Adam. <laughs> I'm good. So, how was it for you? Uh, first thing I was curious about: how was um, your first experience? Because you know, you just had a solo exhibition in the New York of now, mm -hmm. um, and Newton, of course, is like uh, run by young guys of a certain. Uh, I don't know if I want to write them off as. <laughs> I mean, they're my friends, so I don't want to call them hipsters, but let's say it's a hip happening space, <laughs> which is uh, kind of a whole new context for your work. But how did you feel about everything? Well, um, I was uh, I was very pleased that they asked me to do it. And um, I was uh, I went there just a few days uh, before when they were still setting it up. And I said, hey, we're going to have this all set up you know, then, you know, by, by the time of the opening. So I said, okay, <laughs> I trust them completely. And I was, I came the day of the show and the gallery looked fantastic. I was, I was very pleased with, with everything that they did. And yeah. um, the way they set up the video and uh, just for me, it was perfect. It was, uh, I was, uh, sometimes it's good to let others, to sort of trust others and to uh, not be involved too directly because, when they want to do a show, they they came over. Um, this is uh, Paul Lemaire, Paul Gondry, and uh, and Charles uh, Charles uh, Taras. Uh, the three the three of them were the ones who came over, and uh, they uh, you know, they were looking at different work. And I just said to them, choose whatever works you want. You know, it's it's it's. I left myself outside of 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 that process. I I was happy that they were enthusiastically choosing things to, to to for the show and um and they came up with the idea that i should uh put in some animated pieces as well for the for the for the video presentation because they um some of the paintings are based on images that i composed with the daz uh, studio as a software program which uh gives you an endless selection of uh, computer generated people that you can then use whichever way you want you make films with it or whatever and i chose to use that instead of real models at least for that project and they said well why don't you take some of those das files and animate them because i've done that in the past as well so they, they knew that i can do that and it was loads of fun i just had a, i just had fun doing it and it was fun to just trust these guys completely because i knew they were going to do a good job i knew it was going to be fun absolutely and um, I was, uh, it's nice through, I think I had a better time through my non-participation in a, uh, in choosing the work and hanging it up when I, when I went there. It was, it was delightful. And I, yeah. it's especially delightful that young guys are doing it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, well, Paul and Raph both have, a, and, and Nick, sorry, uh, have incredible taste. Paul is, of course, a really great artist uh, himself. Um but yeah, I actually, uh, I have a novel coming out. I thought it would have been out by now, but it's been in the editing process for like a year now. I finished the rough wow. draft. The first time I previewed it with my publisher, uh, Philip Best, um, who was in, he was uh, in the Power Electronics Group White House in the 80s from the UK, but he runs this company now called Amphetamine Sulfate. And he wanted to do, um a new york uh like preview for all the books he was putting out in 2023 of course mine's now been delayed to 2024 anyways but so yeah uh and since i live in new york 
he kicked it over to me to put it together. And the only place that I thought of doing it at was Newton, just because I know I can trust those guys. Um, for one, to not interfere in a negative way, and two, to just get it done. Um, and and the space itself is pretty fantastic, and I think your work looked amazing in it. Well, so is this is this your first novel? This no, it'll out? be. I have two books out already, but this is my second novel. So I oh, like, wow. okay. yeah. Oh, cool. so, I'll look for them. Yeah, I'll send. I'll um. I can just uh, send you copies, but um. Huh? Yeah, so I I the first book was a sort of it was fiction but um sort of interconnected fictions a la something like it's all over the place it's more like a collage of fiction than anything and then the second one is a uh, non-fiction and this one is going to be like the first all the way through one narrative novel epic kind of thing well, that's great I, I really like what uh this this piece you wrote on your on your your blog about the state of the world Oh yeah, that one came to me in a fever dream. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> it was great. Fever dreams are the best. Yeah, <laughs> best way to write. <laughs> That's interesting. Do you find um, I find insomnia is an incredibly rich place to get ideas. Have you ever been afflicted with it? All my life, lifelong insomniac, right That's here. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. So that's crazy because I feel like we already kind of have this. Uh, we're both sort of polymaths. Mm. um and we also can't sleep <laughs> i wonder yeah. if i wonder if there's a connection there but yeah. um but I, I also just wanted to compliment you the animated pieces at the show uh were fantastic and i think um your eyeballs kind of drifting around the room piece to piece and then the cartoons and the video installation just gives you something like in the center just to really grab the attention and sort of amplifies the other pieces around it yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, it was uh, I had I always believe that if you have fun making something, or people are gonna have fun looking at it. And sometimes if you're tortured making something, people will still have fun looking at it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our torture is others' pleasure. It's a state of masochistic relationship with the audience. Yeah. Um. All right. So I wanted to talk to you about um, uh, back in the day, sort of. But, okay, so you do a lot, writing, music, painting, drawing. Um, did all these disciplines, did you show enthusiasm or interest in them, like, all off the bat? Or was it a trajectory of trying new things over a career? Well, I think that probably my first, uh, my first world is, uh, uh, is visual art. Because that's all, when I was a kid, I, was, I became identified as a visual artist for myself really early on. And um, it was something I was always good at and something that I just completely enjoyed. And so for me, I took on the, in my family, I was, I came from a family of uh, four, uh, four boys and one girl. I was smack in the middle. And um, so I was able to, you know, be under, under, uh, under, under cover of sorts, <laughs> just being by the middle, just being the middle child, you can get away with a lot. And uh, I became my my old one of my brothers was a musician, the other brother was an actor, and I was uh, my other uh, two brothers who are musicians actually, but one of them was the real serious classical musician, and the other brother was the actor, and I was uh, I took on a uh, visual art that became my thing, but I noticed that some of the properties of making uh visual art spill over into other things I'm, I'm sure you know this as a as a you know as a polymath yourself it's um there's this sort of like you're taking from the same palette even though it's a different form and there are some things that i i think like with the written word um you know writing things writing stories you can go places that you can't with visual art it's, it evokes a different inner emotion and it could be just as much fun on just by describing things with words. And I started, I realized I, I really enjoyed writing when I was, I guess, a teenager, uh, early teenager. I really enjoyed it. I thought, I love the idea of writing books too. To me, writing a book was, is like a, uh, it's kind of a, uh, a lucid dream. It's like a dream that you know you're dreaming 
Yeah, and yeah. You can do whatever the hell you want because it's just a dream. You can do awful things or wonderful things. <laughs> if, you can just do whatever the hell you want, and um, you know, break windows and you know, and it's just a dream. So, but you, you're aware of it. And writing a novel or a short story or really anything is just to me. It's like that. It's suddenly you're creating a world and you can go as far as you want it's, you can take a, a journey in an unknown place and by writing it's more immediate it has an immediate uh, an immediate effect on i think the, the writer um as opposed to if you're doing painting you or, or or drawing you there's there's another immediacy which which takes longer but i think writing in a way can be faster for the artist i mean that's always been and plus you can you know, people can make people laugh too. And I used to write absurd things in, in school and pass them around to my friends. Of course, and, yeah. And they would laugh. Yeah, I wrote some really vulgar lyrics to a song and the kids were laughing and laughing. So getting people to laugh was, was a big part of it. Um, I always wanted to do music, but, you know, I, I grew up in the 60s and, you know, I'm, I'm 60, I'm about to turn 64. So whatever the year is, everyone knows my age. <laughs> like in 20, 20, 20, 24, I'll be 64. And so back in like the 60s, I was not, I was just not even 10. And, but I always loved listening to music. I loved watching the monkeys on TV. I loved uh, the early, the Beatle films and, and uh, any, it, but it was a rare time, rare chance to, there weren't many chances to actually see musicians perform back then because there was no there was, the concept of the music video wasn't wasn't really hashed yet so uh but i really loved listening to music and i always thought i couldn't do it because anytime i thought about i wanted to be maybe form a band or something you know when i was a teenager people would say oh you must learn you have to really take your time and learn your instrument you have and the one thing which drove me nuts is people or were, were people saying you have to do classical music first for some reason you have to learn all the scales first and i just wanted to just write songs and it's and when punk rock happened that all that was gone and i was yeah. able i felt free to just this is like 1977 just get a crappy guitar from somewhere or I borrowed my brother's guitar. My older brother was a, who, who was playing guitar for a while. And uh, just learning three chords, you can write songs on top of that. And it was immediate and it was fast and it was fun. So I approached music from punk rock. Um, I formed a punk rock band with a couple of friends of mine in high school. And um, we, uh, uh, we got th we we had a gig at our at our high school battle of the bands and we were thrown off the stage after two songs which I was really very pleased with yeah. and um, so it wasn't these things didn't happen immediately but there were it was still drawing from the same well I thought that whatever I took from music the tonal uh, things that pleased me about music the sound of it. I was still taking from that same pot that I was taking uh, whatever inspired me to do drawing, visual art, and also word art, you know, writing. It's a little bit like, I, I like to think of it as um, there's, these are the primary colors of creation. There's, I mean, a creation, I don't like that word, a creating things. Yeah. And uh, it's like the three primary colors. One primary color is writing. The other primary color is visual art, and the other one is sound. And there's probably others, but uh, you know, at least for me, it's it's all kind of the same. But I, I got my education in art. I was an art major in high school. Yeah, I went there from '78 to '82, and uh, um, it was it was it was fun it was fun to meet other artists and to uh but a lot of people i met in school they all a lot of people had like one foot in music or they had one foot in writing i found a lot of artists like to like to go in, in other places as well but um yeah. yeah i think uh it's interesting because for me like rock and roll was the the jettison because i came up you know, in 94, when Cobain dies, I'm seven years old. And my dad is a Gen X rock and roll guy. So he took me to see REM on the wow. Monster Tour when I was like eight years old. Wow. 
you Excellent. know, yes. Excellent. And, and I think like, if you're watching MTV at that point, people don't realize it now, but you could like learn a lot. You could go pretty deep with it. You know, like yeah. Yeah. If you read a Cobain interview, you might learn the butthole surfers or half Japanese or, and then or writers, boroughs or whatever. So that became like the template for everything and music videos. Yeah. It was just like at the center of it all. It's true. And music video also, I think, helped people cross those borders. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, it's, it's like mini filmmaking. It was, exactly. I, I remember music videos were, they were unheard of. For, you know, just people didn't think about that. And all of a sudden, music videos were were a thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to combine things. I mean, that's why I also like working with video, too. I like making that stuff because that, that combines things together too, you know, on a do it yourself scale. Yeah, absolutely. My, uh, my band and uh, my friend Bradford Kessler, who's a sculptor and a filmmaker, we made an, a video for our entire album over the summer. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. It was like the most fun thing. It was strenuous as hell. Cause I had to be like, it was like freezing on the beach and I was basically naked and freezing my ass off for two days, but um, yeah. a lot of fun nonetheless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, and uh, and we kept it kind of cheap. You know, it costs like twelve hundred bucks. All things said and done, worked with friends. Yeah. Um. So you studied art, I assume, at Parsons. Yeah. Um. I was an illustration major actually because I like drawing, and um, I would have majored in painting, but I thought I can get a lot of, a lot more drawing technique, that I wanted through the illustration department, mm -hmm. and um uh it was a it was a fun strenuous experience um i didn't live in the city at the time i was still my parents are from long island so i i lived at home and um i used to work in a department store on the weekends on long island in westbury so i would uh i would do my work at, at school then i take the train to uh westbury and i would work in a department store and then i would make my way back home i'd do my homework, fall asleep. And it was, it was kind of like, it was a bit relentless, but uh, it was art school. So were there any and, illustrators that you admired at that point? R. Crumb or anyone? Oh yeah. Yeah. No, no. And, and, and of course I studied under this guy. Um, he used to, he, I don't know if he still does it. Um, he was uh, the, uh, he was, he used to do political editorial illustration, uh, Edward Sorrell uh, for the nation. Okay. And he was really, really funny. He was great at insulting students too. Half the kids dropped out of class because they didn't get his sense of humor. He was he had a very great insulting way of speaking. He insulted me left and right. I thought he was great. I stayed in his class. Um, but it's it's more like it was really at the time. I mean, I loved a lot of the early comic book art, like the fabulous very freak brothers and that kind of stuff. Um, but I was, uh, I went to Parsons really because of the courses, you know, that I could, that I can take. And, uh, I just wanted to learn how to do, do things. I, I thought if I was in a fine arts department, I'd be already expected to have achieved that, Yeah. you know? So I thought I can, I can get more hands-on, um, a technique. Yeah. That's what I was really looking for, for skills, for skills building when I was there. And it was good. It was a good place for that. I mean, back in the late seventies, early eighties, I have no idea what it's like now, but um, I actually, I did graduate school at city college in the art department there. And I kind of preferred that. Cause then I was, uh, this is maybe, I guess I started that in, I graduate, I got my master's degree in 91. So that was, uh, I guess from 88 to 91. And I, I, that's, we had some good, good faculty members too. We had Al Loving was on the faculty there. Um, and so was, uh, this painter, Jay Milder. And I just got a lot out of, then I was ready to do the fine art route. It's like illustration. I, for me, I took as far as I can go. I tried to work as an illustrator. I never made it. And, but going to graduate school again, I felt I really actually progressed as, as an artist. And, um, I kind of discovered a, a lot of things I wanted to do it was actually in graduate school at city college. And uh, so, you know, Parsons was good. City college for me was just as good. So 
And in between this time, I think it's uh, also compelling that, at least for people listening, that, um, I mean, you joined King Missile, you co-formed it with John S. Hall. And mm -hmm. I think the backstory to this is amazing because most people know King Missile from a Detachable Penis, which was a track that came out after you were in the band, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but nevertheless, the whole thing started because John Hall was reciting his poetry and thought it was like boring just to read it people. <laughs> so you started soundtracking his poetry and that became King Missile. Which is yeah. so nuts because that first those first two King Missile records that you're on, they don't sound just like spoken word poetry with music. They're like loud fucking psychedelic punk rock music. So <laughs> anyways, what was that whole experience like? Well, I knew John through friends of uh, mutual friends years and years ago. And he had a band called You Suck. <laughs> um, Great name. And the concept was... He, they would gather as many people up on stage and to have to present to the public a completely messy, extravagant e experience. Mm. A lot of people weren't playing anything. And it was actually just a guitar and a bass player and a, and, you know, a xylophone and a lot of crazy stuff. And they had songs like Get the Fuck Off the Stage or another <laughs> song called, uh, uh, well, the... Uh, it was it was the name of the other one I can't remember, but they would do a lot of like sloppy bad covers too of songs, really really fucked up versions of songs, and um, they call, they call themselves "You Suck" because people would yell out "You Suck" and they go "Yeah yeah" they're chanting our name. Bring it <laughs> and then, on! <laughs> and then someone in the audience once yelled, "Get the fuck off the stage!" and they wrote a song oh, called song, yeah. Yeah, "Fuck Off the Stage." So uh, John was the. He, there's a series of people involved in that band where they were all brilliant and john in particular was was quite brilliant and uh i never played with them i did stuff on stage with them i once shaved the beard off on stage i did stupid things with them and um but i never really actually i never played an instrument with them i had a band at the time called the schizocrats that okay. i was i was working on so i didn't really like the idea of being in too many bands at the same time and um, I was also playing uh, shows by myself with my electric guitar because I I heard the record by Billy Bragg it was just electric guitar and vocals. And I, I, I wasn't happy with the way any of the bands I was forming at that particular point in time. I wasn't really satisfied with that. So um, my bands all broke up. And so I was uh, I was just I just did it alone. I had a better response and I did it under the name Dog Bowl. So. Uh, John, uh, John was actively, uh, you know, doing readings and, uh, he asked me, say, hey, wouldn't it be cool if you just played some chords, you know, while I'm doing it. So we started playing together a lot and we got, um, Rebecca, uh, who was a friend of John's at the time and Alex DeLazlo to eventually, we formed out the, we we kind of got the inner core of the band that kind of slowly fell in place and um it was a, it was a lot of fun i opened up i it opened up my eyes and my ears to a lot of stuff i never even thought about i discovered a whole scene uh in in new york that i was not entirely aware of um and he's a great frontman he's really hilarious yeah. and uh he's uh he's his stage patter is so good <laughs> and i have a good <laughs> rapport with him anytime him and i are on stage we're you know we 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 have a lot of fun and um yeah, so then King Missile uh, got got uh, uh, King Missile got. I didn't even want to say signed to Shimmy Disc. Originally, we were making a demo of sorts, and we went to Noise New York, where Kramer was uh, had his, his his original recording studio. It was in Midtown Manhattan at the time. So we went to Noise New York, and we recorded "Fluting on the Hump," and uh, Which Kramer. Is a great record. Thanks. Yeah, I'm very, 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 very pleased. We played that all those songs recently at City Winery last um, September. Oh, we had a reunion. How did I miss yeah. that? It was sold out. That's why. Right. It got sold out really <laughs> quickly. I, I couldn't believe it. And yeah. so we played there. We played a lot of songs from Fluting on the Hump and a lot of songs from the sec from the follow-up record, They. Um, and uh, 
so anyway, so Kramer said, I have this, I'm starting a label called Shimmy Disc. You want to, uh, you want to put this out onto it? Cause he's, and I, we thought that we were just making a demo that we would shop around, but Kramer said, no, this is a record. You already made the record. So let's just put it out. This is it. And what I liked about working with him is he, and his labels, he was very immediate. He would say, okay, let's make this record. And he, as soon as you, you were finished with the record, he'd start, he'd get you working on the next one. It wasn't like a million years of waiting. He was very immediate. He got stuff yeah. done. Yeah. yeah. And he did a um, lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I um, made, a, I made, let's see the two record, two King Missile records, uh, four dog ball records and two dog ball and Kramer records. So I, I, yeah, I've I would, heard one of the I heard Hot Do um Hot Day in Waco, which is a great yeah. album title. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, Kramer, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. It's um I was just saying that oh yeah, so I was just talking about how King Missile kind of made their first few records was um Jesse got fluting on a hump, uh came out. Kramer knew how to send copies to all the college radio stations, and it, it did well. People liked it. And then we followed it up with they, but that time the band personnel had changed. Uh, Rebecca and Alex, they left the band. So in a way it was just John and I, and we were able to work with different people. And um, I like fluting on a hump, but for me, they is much more of a, you know, I felt much more deeply involved in in they over, as opposed to fluting on a hump, which I, I was deeply involved with it, but uh those were some of those songs we had played many times before at poetry readings. And, you know, so we kind of you know. mastered them. Yeah. 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 I think it's, I think, you know, I obviously implore all the listeners to check these records out because like, you know, Kramer, he had great taste obviously, but he was always looking for a very specific things in the artists he signed. And like, it seems like the people that he worked with the most either had, there were things like, you know, in on the joke concept, he are sort of <laughs> off kilter stuff or, and in on the joke concept, he art stuff that really fucking also rocked. So, you know, on that end, you would have things like, um, boredoms or, mm. um, or galaxy 500 or, or, uh, King missile. Cause like the craziest thing for me, when I first learned about, King Missile's early records with you on them is like Detachable Penis was a song that would just get like sent around as like a jokey thing between friends when I was in high school, you know, like sort of early millennial, like check this fucking thing out. Um, <laughs> but then I get the actual, like those early records and the sound is big, you know, it sounds like big, thick, late 80s psychedelic rock in the way that like it has that thick sound that almost, you know, would get, you know, you'd hear with Dinosaur Jr. or My Bloody Valentine, like these like thick, thick reverb Latin guitars, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's so uh, we double tracked a lot of that stuff. And uh, it's funny. I guess we were shoegazers in our own way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just not gazing at the shoes, but just, you know, with the <laughs> reverb Latin guitars. Yeah. Uh, uh yeah. yeah go ahead no i was gonna say that i learned a lot also uh with that experience too it's like i never i mean i always enjoyed you know doing four track work but you know going into making records at a uh, noise new york is <laughs> it's that's an education in and of itself because the way he worked was uh very uh he was very open about the way he was doing everything and uh he was very good at explaining why he was producing these sounds and so i trusted him i, I thought that he did a, a really nice job with all those with all those records yeah he's for sure like uh i mean he's absolutely a mythical figure i love that everybody just knows him as kramer and not as mark kramer but a lot of <laughs> records that a lot of bands that are in artists that i really like he's directly responsible for at least elevating like half japanese the aforementioned mm. Galaxy 500, the aforementioned Boredoms, Daniel Johnston. Like, mm. there is a lot of stuff that reached a pretty good audience yeah. that would have had no chance without him. I was curious if you guys um, maintain a friendship now. I mean, I don't, I, we, I, we lost touch with each other. We don't really, uh, you know, he, he lives in, um, he lives in uh, Florida. 
I saw him. I saw him at a ball reunion. It was the last time I saw him. The ball had a reunion, and uh, actually, I actually went with John, mm. and uh, it was great. It was good to see him again. And um, but I haven't seen him. I, you know, I lost touch with him. I mean, I, I I see what he on Facebook. He posts stuff, so <laughs> I know that he's okay. Good. But, um, it, um, he's uh, uh, you know, he's very busy. I think he stopped doing music for a while. I'm not sure, but I th and then I think he uh, he was, uh, I, th I think he was working on mastering a lot, which I imagine he'd be very good at. Yeah. And um, he, uh, I, th I think he relaunched Shimmy Disc now, so there's a new Shimmy Disc uh, with all new artists, and it's great. I'm glad that they're doing it. Fantastic. So you didn't leave King Missile on bad terms. I assume maybe you just did dog books you wanted to start performing your own written songs well, kind of a, a combination of the above of every of all the above uh my um i was married for 30 years to a, a french woman and uh okay. she died like six years ago oh god so, i'm so sorry to hear that thanks um she was a. Uh, we were living in france at the, at, at the time a lot and um if i if king I started going with king missile i i i had this idea that Maybe I'm right or wrong, but I have this idea. I always had this idea that I wouldn't be able to go to France and and hang out in Paris as, as much. And we were going to have kids, and I wanted to be really involved with my kids. And I guess that's a, I guess it's kind of my. I was thinking in, in a very limited way, but I thought you were well, in love. Son, I'm sorry. You were in love. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. My my wife was was really a wonderful person, and uh, she's gorgeous too, and. Uh, so I, I thought, well, I have to, I felt like it's true. We're in New York a lot, but also in Paris a lot. And, and, uh, leaving the band was not so much a decision where I felt it wasn't like a full cue. It was like, well, I can't really do it anymore. But I, I told the guys at the time, I told this to Kramer, I said to John, I, I, I'll keep writing, you know, music if you guys want. But then it got Dave Rick of Bongwater and Phantom Tollbooth. And when they got Dave, they didn't need me. I mean, Dave is really great. You know? <laughs> so I'm I'm happy that they that they got a, the new lineup. I love the King Missile record that came out after after they um what's it called again? Uh oh, my brain is not functioning that well anymore. Uh mystical oh, shit. Yeah, and, mystical shit. Yeah, I love that record. My wife loved that record. And um, it's funny enough, it's almost like Dave Rick and I sort of traded places because after he left Bongwater to being King Missile, I left King Missile and I was playing with Bongwater for a while after that <laughs> uh, on their live. I was the second guitarist for their live gigs. Uh, but John and I were still pals after that. I mean, I, I kind of fell out of touch with John for a while. And because then King Missile got, yeah, they got bigger. And who knows if I was in the band, maybe they would nothing would have happened you know it's it's uh i'm not the one who made them famous uh yeah. dave and, and chris and john did that and and roger and those guys you know they're the ones who put out detachable penis and jesus was way cool and some of the songs that people really remember king missile with and but i was you know i was content with my sid barrett like <laughs> role <laughs> In yeah, the, the world where I was the original guitar player, and then I left, and then they then they got you know, Pink Floyd got huge after Sid Barrett left, and I think that's what happened. I'm not yeah, sure. But whereas uh, Sid Barrett degenerated into LSD enhanced psychosis, you married a beautiful woman and had a family. So I guess <laughs> on the scale of things, you did uh, you did a bit better. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I like to think so, but he's uh um uh that's just kind of a, a fun way of looking at it it's uh after that after that group of king missile that particular form of it they broke up and then john and i started playing again yeah and we we went on we had a tour in 1995 and um uh we toured uh, most a few southern uh, states out west and uh i think we got as far north as portland maine uh, it was really fun. It was fun to play with them. And, and through the years, sometimes I would play with King Missile, sometimes not. You know, it was often because I was living, in, I was in France. And so, uh, you know, in those days, it was, 
it wasn't so easy to make music with people who were living thousands of miles away. You know, back then it was tough that you didn't have files. You can, there was no, the concept of putting a computer file, sending it across the ocean in the, you know, the early nineties just <laughs> didn't exist. Yeah. So yeah, I was, okay. No, no, go ahead. Um, I was just curious, you know, so the, the thing with dog bowl that is so kind of mind blowing to me is it has that, you know, if you're a guided by voices fan, you, some, you, you hit a point where you're like, how many freaking songs does Robert Pollard write? You know, <laughs> there's like a, th a thousand of these fucking things. Um, and you similarly, uh, have a ton of songs like even on that first record there's like 30 some odd tracks or something like that and yeah. um it has a sound that i've always you know that i look for in certain kind of music you know it even reminds me of a lot of like the new zealand garage pop kind of bands that were happening at the time like the clean or the bats and that sort of like ultra sim yeah. uh, simple chords but as uh, an out kind of feel to it but what did um, Dog Bowl express for you that you didn't find uh, you were able to express as a member of a bigger band? Well, I felt like I came out of the this this world where if you're in a band, it had to be like an ultimate democracy. Like everything had to be approved by everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for better or for worse, like this one band is schizocrats and they were fantastic musicians. They were really great. But we, I felt like we all had to agree on everything. Everything had to be ag agreed on. And I, I didn't get the immediate satisfaction after a while. And there were people were constantly arguing with each other. And there was all these, you know, band personalities and uh, stuff that uh, was just indicated to me that this band is kind of doomed. <laughs> so <I> just, <laughs> you know, some nice music. And um, so... That's when I get back to to uh, playing alone. Is that I arrived at that conclusion after hearing Billy Bragg just play with his electric guitar, and he was he sounded like a punk rock band. He was just by himself, and it was sort of like playing by myself with electric guitar on stage. It was sort of like returning to my punk rock roots to a certain degree. Yeah, uh, even though I love melodies, I, I you know not. I don't love most punk rock, but punk rock is really sort of where I was the my kindergarten class. And uh, I um, I found that by working alone and in a more sparse way, I can then invite people to play when I wanted to. Like the first time I played uh, some of that stuff on that first record was like I got my brother to come up on stage with me at CBGB's once. So just the two of us, we went through a bunch of songs and he had his clarinet. And um, I just thought that I felt more free to be able to do what I wanted to do instead of having to negotiate with, you know, and a couple of other bands I had. And I found I formed a couple of other bands after that period. And it turned into the same thing, like, oh, the, once one person's unhappy with something, so we have to change everything. And, you know, it's, I, uh, I guess these bands were not, we all didn't see the eye, eye to eye on it, on it, but What's fun about working with John with King Missile is that uh, we don't even discuss anything. We just kind of do it. And <laughs> yeah, this is what happened you know, a few few months ago. We added a couple of uh, new members too, and everything was just. It was such a pleasure to play with John again, and to play with uh, Alex and Rebecca again, and uh, these two 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 new people added a whole new. Uh, we played with uh, Susan Wang. She does uh, the Brooklyn. Um, a Bushwick book club and she organizes a lot of she's in a lot of groups and she's wonderful and this guy Marlon Cherry is both of them added so much to this reunion that uh that it, they they brought a lot of new energy into it and they were like in the same zone as we were so in that case it worked out super well I like being in bands with people where I don't have to tell anybody anything and exactly. when I made Cyclops Nuclear Submarine Captain I had that ensemble toured a lot, not toured, but we did a lot of uh, playing out. And I never had to tell Michael Schumacher, the guitar player, what to do. I never had to say to my brother, Chris, what to do. 
or to the drummer, Ray Sage, or Lee Ming Ta, the bass player. We would just say, say, here's the song, and then we'd all start playing, and it sounded great. I, there was none of that disagreement or I object to this, you know, that <laughs> thing, or I don't think we should do that, and you know, nothing like that. It was just fun. And uh, so that's the kind of band I like working with, but eventually I stripped that band down to a three-piece because all of a sudden with a five piece, I felt also I was losing control of my own songs. I, I couldn't really uh, get a grip on, on um, if, if the sound is too complicated, too, too much, and you're gigging a lot, I feel like it's time to strip things down a little bit. And for me, a trio, I'd, I'd like to do that a lot too. Just guitar, bass, and drum. I just love the, that combination as well. Love a power So trio. it's good to go back. Yeah, I mean, as a solo artist, you can do that. You can... You know, you could say say um, one gig could, you can do it by yourself, and another gig you can play with a freaking orchestra. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> yeah, more fun if you have people who are people who are willing to to do it. <laughs> yeah, it and, is an um, interesting concept, just because I don't think people realize. Um, like I've run into it myself. I only have you know we're a duo, but we have our. I mean, just today, we uh, recorded a song that my bandmate, usually I do all the lyrics, but he had an idea for this one. So we did like 20 takes and he's trying to get me to deliver it ever, deliver the vocal line ever just so. And I'm like, you know, it's a friend of mine, so I'm trying to be amenable. But in my mind, I'm ready to fucking freak the fuck out <laughs> on him. Um and similarly, when you work with like other artists, even if you're very close friends, that sort of pigheadedness becomes a thing. And it does seem sometimes like especially yeah. in music, the bands that have a really long shelf life are the people that divert to sort of like an authoritarian figure at the center, whether it's like the bad seeds or or, you know, whoever, whoever the guys yeah. are that stay around a long time have a leader, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it comes down to that. For sure. Or uh, sometimes, yeah. But um, no, but after I left King Missile, I was still, I used to go see them. And uh, and uh, I even, we had like a super King Missile once when the, I think it was John and Dave Rick. And um, I'm not sure Chris Sifos did this, but Roger Murdoch of the, you know, post Dog Bowl King Missile, they started doing some reunion shows that combination and he played stuff from like happy hour and um the way to salvation all, all those songs that i had almost nothing to do with and just and i had nothing to do with them I, I wrote a couple of songs on mystical shit but after mystical shit i i was there was no, no no footprint of mine on any king missile stuff um but they uh so they they invited me to play some songs to them at hank's saloon in brooklyn this is right before the pandemic. And it was great to play with with those guys. And um, but then that that con that lineup kind of dissolved again. And yeah. uh, there's this record label in Nashville that's reissuing um uh, th I think three of my solo records. And uh they're called Needle Juice Music. And oh yeah, I've seen them on Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're they've they've put some of my, my old Shimidas records uh, on band on um, Bandcamp and uh, Spotify and all those places, and they um, they're also doing the first two King Missile records as they're reissuing reissuing those as vinyl, and um, so because they uh, um, they're doing this, you know, both John and I are very very pleased. I'm happy to have my old records available again, and I don't know when the vinyl will come out, but. You know, they're going to do Cyclops, Nuclear Submarine Captain, Tit and Opera. And, oh my God! Um, they put out a they put out an album by my great uncle. Oh wow! Tom Lehrer. Tom Lehrer. Tom Lehrer. He's oh, a okay. satirical folk musician and a MIT professor. He's my grandfather on my father's side, first cousin. So I guess that makes him like. Oh wow! Yeah. I they hated each other, so I've never met him. <laughs> <laughs> Last families for you. Yeah, I uh, Hi, I didn't even but, know uh, he was a big deal be until remember Mojo Magazine, the British rock magazine. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had an issue like top hundred protest songs, and then I saw a number ninety eight 
uh, Tom Lehrer, one of his songs. And I was like, oh, shit. It's my, it's my uncle or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. Man, the, that's so, great. Yeah, it looks like these guys are doing a great service for rock and roll history. Needle juice, that is. Well, there's the woman who works for them. Yeah, her, uh, her name is Kendra Shepard. And she's a huge supporter. She huge supporter of King Missile so much. I, I call her the King Missile guardian angel <laughs> because she was coming to New York. And John said to me, you know, maybe we should do a show because Kendra from the record company is coming. It'd be kind of a cool thing to do. So it was really because she was she came to New York that we decided to do this. And, you know, she's proper guardian angel, I suppose. And um, but she's a. Uh, uh, she, she's sort of the person who I, I think is very involved with uh, picking bands for the for the label to put out, and uh, so it's thanks to her. And, Fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so your the the Dog Bowl album covers are all your art, right? Yeah. So you're painting well, and drawing. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, well, fl I mean, yeah. I, Tit and Opera was, uh, yeah, that, that one, Cyclops, yeah, Flan, yeah, I did those first three. Uh, Project Success is just S. Masiosi took a simple picture of me. And uh, let's see. And yeah, but yeah, most of yeah, those, those are early records, especially Flan was kind of, because Flan was the novel that uh, Four Walls, Eight Windows had put out. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so when when that was coming out, I thought it would be a really fun idea to make a record also to retell the story, but with songs. Yeah. So the record came out first and a book came out. And. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was that's a that's you know, that was a really fun thing to do is just to in a way I felt liberated also when writing songs. Uh, for Flan, I felt like, good, this is like a. I can write a song about this. I can write a song about that. I can write a song about this happening. And it was a different way of songwriting for me. And I really enjoyed it. So speaking it was, of it uh, to, to... speaking of Flan, I don't know if you're aware of this, but an author and novelist named David David Katzman says Flan is, quote, the most disturbing and weirdest novel I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> and um I unfortunately Very have flattered. not been a, <laughs> I unfortunately have not been able to read it yet, but it's next on my list. But from what I understand, it's about a man who wakes up to find his bed, his home, his whole city on fire. Mm -hmm. And which, uh which it's, it's, tough, it's, a, yeah. it's kind of a post apocalyptic yeah, it's a post apocalyptic novel. And when I was a kid, I was obsessed with nuclear war. I was just obsessed with it because I would see information on the television and, and the newspaper and the atomic bomb. And I felt, you know, why am I bothering going to school? There's going to be a nuclear war. We're all going to die. So I had a, an apocalyptic uh, sensibility. And I used to uh, uh, imagine, wow, if there's a nuclear war, everything would be burned and destroyed. So Flan is kind of that. And it's, but it's it's much more surreal. Like there's a you know people turn into animals and animals talk and and there's a lot of lot of violence. And just I tried to scare myself when I was writing it, and I had a lot of nightmares before that. And so some of the scenes are from nightmares that that I had related to nuclear catastrophe. And um, but I wanted to do I want to do it with humor too. And um, that uh i wrote that out by hand and uh you know my wife was oh you have to publish this you must publish this she had a french accent and <laughs> you know i didn't really know <laughs> the first thing and her and i just took it around to a couple of different places and this one office um this one publisher called four walls eight windows uh they liked it right away i mean I, by then i typed it up it wasn't written by hand anymore and you know, back then you had to take a book to a, a photocopy place and, you know, wait while they photocopied it and they would give you a couple of copies like that and bind it like that. And um, so uh, so my my wife, I guess maybe I don't know, she could have been my girlfriend at the time. Uh, 
we took it to this small office and an editor there really liked it. And he was going to recommend it to one of the publishers and uh, they put it out and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I couldn't freaking <laughs> believe it. Uh, then I wrote, I spent eight years on another novel, which went nowhere. I wrote another novel after that and it never got published. No one wanted to publish it. And Four Walls, Eight Windows, uh, they, they didn't really want to do the second book either. Um, and then uh, I wrote the next one I wrote, which came out was called 100% Lunar Boy. And that got picked up by McAdam Cage, which is the publisher in San Francisco that put out The Time Traveler's Wife. It's, that's what they're more famous for. But they were unfortunately in bad financial situation. Uh, so that that publishing house dissolved not long after 100% Lunar Boy came out. Wow. But 100% Lunar Boy was optioned to be made into a film a few times. So it had success in its own way. It was translated into Russian and French and Japanese. So that did pretty well. That one did that one did pretty well. So Fantastic. I'm not sure what's next. Yeah, it's it's Flan came out in ninety two, which is crazy to me because if you read about it, it's almost like you're reading about um with certain parts of San Francisco or Broadway Myrtle M train stop feel like now. <laughs> you know? <laughs> like it has a prophetic quality to it considering kind of where the <laughs> urban environment has ended up, uh, post internet, post COVID, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. Well, it's uh. Well, hold on. I think my dog is eating something. Hold on. That's all right. Oh, my dog likes to eat so many absurd things. He was eating a piece of Velcro. <laughs> that'll do. That'll do really. That'll do wonders for your digestive system, Satter. That'll yeah. be good. We had a puggle before this purebred pug named Bibi, and she could consume. One time, uh, we left the room for like ten minutes, and we had accidentally left out our burgers and fries all wrapped up on my coffee table oh, yeah. gone for not but 10 minutes we come back yeah. to find that she'd eaten every yeah. fucking thing in sight including the cardboard and tinfoil yeah. <laughs> that's what they do <laughs> yeah they're incredible animals yeah. they're brutally honest <laughs> <laughs> they keep food they want it it's food even if it's not food they're going to Think this might be food. I'm gonna eat it. It's a hat. I think I'm gonna eat this hat. Okay. It wasn't quite edible, but I'm satisfied. I ate a hat. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you find yourself um uh, like I mean, writing and writing a long book is so fucking involving. I mean, I've been there, it makes it kind of hard to do anything else for me personally outside of it, which is especially tough because I have like a regular column and you know media projects yeah. that need maintaining but do you find yourself only working on a novel um if if you're in the zone of it or do you still paint do you still make songs well i try to i try to do both because in my case i, I find the three things feed off each other in an yeah. when things are ideal um so sometimes i'll be writing something and i get an idea this this suddenly i'm I, i'm called to my guitar and to do something it's like having three kids who are completely demanding your attention all the time and uh i i find that i'll like for example right now i'm doing a these i'm painting these guitars i have this this project where i want to paint uh 12 different guitars electric guitars and um treat them like actual paintings but I'll be working on that, and then I get some, I get distracted by something else, or so I, I do get very distracted. So I don't, I'm not achieving what I really want to achieve lately because I'm just so distracted by life and and things. So, but um, I noticed one thing which I find difficult is that when I was working as an art teacher, it's tough for me to put all my mojo or to address the mojo I have to, to do painting if I was teaching painting all day to my students. I mean, I don't, I'm retired. I don't teach anymore. But mm -hmm. uh, when I was, when I had a, when I had students and I'd be working with them on, you know, doing a still life or, or whatever, or different, you know, color exercises, I would come home and 
you know, can I didn't feel like painting at all. And now it's the opposite. Now that I'm not doing it anymore, I'm much more enthusiastic about painting. So it could be when you mentioned writing, and if you also uh, doing other uh, other media outlets where you're working as a as a writer, that can be kind of tough. That's actually tougher in a way. It's not always so easy. I find that I need. Um... For me, the thing that centers me is strenuous physical activity. So, you know, in high school, I was a competitive runner and wrestler. And now I, I body build pretty seriously. So I find that that gets me out of my head a little bit because ultimately my entire work day is standing in front of this fucking machine. It does make you go crazy yeah. after a while. So, I mean, I love yeah. performing and I love like, I love the actual physicality of things, feeling things in the moment, I find that that actually gets me out of the neurotic head space, which is helpful. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a way it's, it's uh, the relationship between like physical, like sport and, and, and art, I think is much deeper than people. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny you said that because people would always imagine it's such a, divide between people into sports and art but i think it's the opposite i think both artists and athletes draw from a source of intelligence that is not defined by language yeah in a way yeah and it's almost like uh kids who are like really great in sports they have they're they're, they're using their intelligence in a way that is not uh similar to like math or math and science and 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 you know, literature and, and all that and history and all that. But it's I think it's more in tune to like what artists are doing and Absolutely. vice versa. Well, it's interesting. The, this point is interesting because when I was a kid in a I grew up on Cape Cod, which is like very much uh, you know, there's you know, there's the rich summer people, but the people that live there are rough and tumble, sort of car heart jackets and work boots kind of people. So what did you what did you say? I missed up where you said you grew up where? Cape, I, I'm, I grew up on Cape Cod. Oh, Cape Cod. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So I like know. Cape Cod a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love it too. But uh, growing up there, uh, it, it is sort of like, especially people who live there full time, it is sort of a rough, macho sort of place, you know, Carhartt pants and work boots kind of place. So yeah. uh, my artistic interests as a high school athlete were certainly questionable in the eyes of many of my friends. But on the flip side of that, I think about, you know, there's fucking, you got Eve Klein, who was a black belt in judo. Uh, yeah. Hemingway yeah. was a boxer. Arthur Cravan, yeah. daughter's poet, competed as a boxer. Con I just wrote yeah. this piece for a, a, a journal called I Am 1776 about Conor McGregor, where I argued that Conor McGregor what made him so successful is that he has more of an artistic disposition than he does a meathead jock <laughs> one, you know, he performs yeah. great at it, you know? So yeah, I'm always very fascinated wore, in this. He once wore a suit that was really funny. It was, you look at it from far away, it looks like stripes <laughs> and you get up closer. The stripes just says, fuck you. <laughs> Repeatedly over I remember over. that one. So it's just like fuck you. It's like, oh, like a million fuck yous. Impeccable three piece, perfectly fitted. Yeah, he's he's unreal. That was really, really funny. Um so when did your painting start to be shown in galleries? It was like mid nineties, right? I guess so. Um I didn't really have a lot of I was invited to more like a lot of group shows to participate in, or there'd be someone who was, there was once someone who was curating at NYU and she asked me to be in a show, to, to do a solo show at, at NYU in I think the Stern lobby once. And I was in a show uh, that was uh, in Bruges that was uh, put together by this famous Belgian uh, cartoonist named Kamagurka. And he always liked my stuff, so he invited me to uh matter of fact, I think I have, yeah, this is this is a, a show he put together. Fantastic. And yeah, I'm in the catalog. It's uh it's pretty funny, but it's all written in Flemish and uh uh where's mine? It's uh 
Let me see that. Oh, here we go. Here's some of my my guitars. Amazing. And so the, these painted guitars. What kind of guitars and, are those? Well, this is actually a really kind of a cheap, um, kind of a jazz mastery guitar. It's an SX called the SX Liquid. And I have a bunch of them. I got them from Rondo Music. Uh, they're like a they can be as low as $150, depending on nice. their, their slightly, slightly dented. They're really, really super nice guitars. And I'm, I'm just really into, into I, I just love guitars a lot. And yeah, me too. I buy them too, too often. I have too many guitars. I have to sell some. And just for space. And But I have some of these guitars I bought simply because I can paint on them. And um, see, I think I actually have one. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Okay, so this, oh, this, okay, I think it's over here. Oh, yeah, this one, this, this one is, oh. I feel like it's show and tell. It's like, okay, Steve, now it's time to show the class what you did for homework or what you do over the weekend. Well, it's, this is one of them. Other pickups are falling out. Oh, that is fucking and, uh, awesome. Sort of has I mean, a Dali did, vibe I, to it. Almost, yeah, yeah. I mean, Salvador Dali would do the kind of thing. He, has, he, he knew how to take take a space. And this is one I'm, I'm, I'm layering in colors because I'm kind of obsessed with um, the way they painted in the Renaissance. So first yeah. I would just do this kind of Incredible. thing where... Honey, you see this? Um, that's... Uh, it's a, uh, just the underpainting. And then I would... I'm going to layer Whoa. in colors on top of that. And This is the same kind of guitar that I showed you last time. It's the, uh, the SX. Beautiful, uh, yeah. By so, I can't believe that guitar is 150 bucks. The shape is so nice. Oh yeah, they're really, really nice. It's, and they have they have them. They'll 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 have good sales every now and then. I think normally they're still under two hundred dollars, or they might be two hundred fifty. Um, I have a few squires that I'm going to paint. I have a I have squire a, at one a, point. A, yeah, they're, it's, they're they're good guitars, and I have um I got some guitars from this company uh, called Hardluck Kings. They had some. Uh, uh, Firebird copies that were pretty reasonable, and so I bought like three of those. And because I love the Firebird, I love the shape of the Firebird. And uh, from Guitar Fetish, of course, they have really good guitar parts and guitars. And so I am kind of addicted to buying guitars. But if I tell myself I'm going to do that with them, then I'm, I feel justified. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives yourself a reason to keep buying them. I mean, I have my guitars that I play. Um, we did the King Missile show i borrowed my son's he has really really nice um fender stratocaster that i never played a stratocaster on stage before and i really loved it normally i, I, I like offset That's so nice such a nice guitar and um i have a i have a gibson firebird that i i also like to play out and those i don't i have another i have actually two firebirds i have a a Firebird made by this company, Firefly. They also have really cheap guitars too. I have a really cheap Fire Firebird copy that I played a couple of times, which sound is nice. But I also have a real Firebird. Lately, I'm into G and L guitars, so I just got um the gig when I played the gig at at the gallery. That was with the G and L um a copy of a Jazzmaster. But it's you know just. Can't stop buying them. And yeah. uh, so the guitars that are really good quality, I'm not going to paint those. <laughs> but <laughs> these cheap ones, Why not? maybe I'll have a show and I'll, and I'll sell them. You know, it's I, I'm making those, maybe sell them. It's, uh, I'll see. I'll see. But it's, maybe I'll, I think I, I won't present them to the public until I get like 12 of them done, though. I think that's sort of my plan. I mean, that'll be an amazing but. show. I'm actually down to one guitar right now. All I have left is a, a BC Rich, a super oh, nice. phallic, heavy, uh, heavy fucking metal in your face. I love how like love obnoxious them. and like loudly ugly they are, you know? Oh, yeah. I love BC Rich guitars. Is it the, uh, 
It's the one with the um the really <laughs> the, the crazy the really, yeah. I, Michelle, can you grab the guitar right there? It looks like an axe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a sledgehammer. I think I got this one because Carrie King played it on one of the Slayer tours. Excellent. Yeah, there it is. Boom. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. That's the classic. That's the yeah, that's, that's the real BC Rich guitar. That's a great guitar. I fucking love this thing. I gotta tune it up a little bit. It's I gotta get some new strings on there. I played it so fucking hard at one point that it was like I lost strings, brackets, fucking everything. Um, yeah, but if you want to get, you want to get, you want a guitar that's gonna, you can ride it like a tank. It's a uh, the, the, the the what they call the heavy metal guitars. Those are great, great instruments. They're they're they can take anything and they shred. And if they can shred, they can do anything. You exactly. Know? I love them. Yeah, I was thinking. I just read that. Frushant, John Frusciante is coming out with his own Fender model, and uh, as a fan of his, um, like the first two John Frusciante solo records, I think are like some of my favorite albums ever made. I think I might get the guitar just in honor of him or something. Yeah. This guitar I really am very fond of is the uh, the Dean ML. It's like a mix between an Explorer. It has that. It's like a flying V back, but it oh has, like, yeah, 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 that thing looks metal as fuck. <laughs> I love that guitar and I played a couple of King Missile shows I'm well, not King Missile but I played a couple of shows with John and I played one solo show with um, with one of those guitars and it sounds great through a just you know distortion stomp boxes but it also sounds beautiful when it's yeah. just by itself it's, yeah it's, it sounds clean tone is great so yeah I think yeah. I'll, I'll either going to sell that one or I'm going to. Uh, I don't have much experience selling guitars though, so I don't know what to how to how to go about that. If I should go on Reverb or if I should just take it to Guitar Center and you know, I don't know what to do. <laughs> guitar Center, I think low balls the fuck out of people, but I think if you yeah. put it online as guitar of Stephen Tunney of Dog Bowl and King Missile like on eBay or something, that might be your best way of oh. like fetching a penny. You tap into the, you tap into the cult audience a little bit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's a good idea. I should, yeah. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Like if, yeah. you know, a fender by itself might be worth a thousand, but a, a fender that had Kurt Cobain's fucking fingertips placed upon it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could yeah. it be worth a bit more? Well, it's just re I just read something somewhere about a the guitar that bob dylan played the uh, strat when he when he played i just saw this read this somewhere on online when he did the the the, the festival the folk festival where people the booed him because festival, he was yeah strat. right he actually left that guitar on a plane <laughs> and the <laughs> captain of the airplane claimed it Good so there's him. a legal battle between the captain of the airplane and bob dylan and eventually, I think the court sided with the captain somehow, which sounds absurd. But <laughs> I forget how this captain managed to keep this really famous guitar. And then his family sold it for like a million dollars. Yeah, I'm reading the article right now. A flat million yeah. at auction. <laughs> yeah. Fucking amazing. God damn. Yeah. You do pretty well as a pilot as it is. But that has to be make that makes flights back and forth worth it over and over. Well, that that particular guitar, the guitar that made people boo Bob Dylan, is you know that's a guitar, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I live right across from Forest Hill Stadium. Apparently, Dylan did one of his electric shows across from my house once upon a time. Are you a Dylan fan? Wow. Um, I was a fanatic about Bob Dylan when I was in high school, and uh, I still like him, but. I'm just, you know, I I went on to other things, but every time I hear him, I always like him. But I yeah. haven't heard anything, any of his new records or anything. I think it's like the last record of his I really liked was Blood on the Tracks from like I 73. Mean, um, that's his, that's my favorite Dylan record. It's fucking incredible. Yeah. Tangled Up in Blue, great opening what track. What a great song. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Lay Lady Lay, amazing. Uh, the, that, that um, oh no, Lay Lady Lay is from Nashville Skyline. That's what I'm thinking of. Lay Lady Lay has that great, those chords where he sings, 
He wants to meet you in the morning light. And then here's that, that, da -da 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 -da, that incredible tone. And that's from Nashville Skyline. But um, there's an other song that's in, um, I'm thinking of from, uh, from not Tangle Up in Blue. There's another. Um, uh, A later period. Isn't Idiot killing? Rain? Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, that song's amazing. Yeah. And just the whole record, and that weird, that weird song, it tells a story about a hanging judge, hanging, get people getting hung. But it, when I listen to it, I feel like I'm watching a film in fast motion. It's, uh, what is that? Lily, something in the Queen of Hearts, Jack in the Queen of Hearts. What the fuck is that name? Hype My brain is like not. Images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was great. He was, you know, I'm glad he's still playing or I don't know if I, somebody mentioned, I, a friend of mine saw him recently. Uh, um, they yeah, said it was really played great. here. Uh, my friend yeah. Alec, who does this really interesting travel podcast where he travels around and meets his friends from the internet in real life. But yeah. um, he did oh, an wow. episode where he just like taped his experience going to the Dylan show. He's a fanatic. I've, you know, I'm like on the fence about, I'm glad he's making new stuff, but there's so much like music out there that uh, it's hard to find the time for like a new Dylan album or something. Cause there was a time, yeah. like, you know, like yeah. his, con like the context he comes out of a new record was so novel and everybody could give it so much attention. Now a Dylan record yeah. has to come out the same day that maybe like, a hundred records by a hundred bands you like or have listened to were already uploaded directly into your fucking library. So it's like a whole new context for something like that. Um, yeah. But I mean, he is obvious, like he has his moments and um, still to this day. And I think you're right. Like, because his lyrics are so iconic, I think people don't give him enough credit for the actual sound of his music, which was incredibly novel. Yeah. Yeah, that churning quality to Tangled Up in Blue is just Yeah. Amazing. The way it starts and it keeps going. The whole thing is just really great. Absolutely. You know, and I think one thing I wanted to get across that I that I love about your work is like there was a time in art history, you know, whether it was surrealism or Dada or the Renaissance or even mid medieval times when artists didn't have to be limited to a thing, you know, like, yeah, you have yeah. Pierre Klosowski, the guy is a philosopher, poet, and a, a painter of pornography, basically. You have um, Artaud, who was writing plays and poems and theory and acting and painting. And you have Francis Picabia, who's a poet and obviously an iconic painter and like, people used to understand that there could be like different mechanisms, which different images or ideas or things could be expressed. And that like, if you declare yourself an artist, it's sort of your right uh, and your responsibility to try everything. But I think um, post-modernism and post the industrialization of it, everything, of everything, people feel they have to narrow themselves into a career or something yeah absolutely absolutely i mean they understood back then they they understood you know the, the, that they weren't limited but i think people do feel like you know or even if you tell people that you do music people say what kind of music do you do and i have trouble answering that question you know people say what what's your band like or what do you sound like and you know i i, I just uh, I'm not really fond of, of categories. There's some categories that, you know, make a lot of sense, but, you know, for the most part, I think people should try, people should try different things when they're, when they're creating things. And, um, they don't necessarily have to stick to whatever genre that yeah. they were, you know, they first came out. Yeah. And but, it's uh, an artists should feel totally free. Yeah. And that question about genre is like, even more annoying when you know the person who's asking it has like a very narrow breadth of a um, taste or whatever, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like you're going up to like 
I can imagine someone going up to uh, whatever Japanese noise artist Masana and being like, "What kind of music do you list? Do you make? Like, what do you? You're not gonna <laughs> like it, you know. It it doesn't matter." So to preempt that, I created a genre name to define our sound, which is pump metal. Uh, metal oh, does like pump, yeah, metal designed to stimulate a pump in the gym during workouts was the idea. <laughs> Excellent. You see, there you go. Going back to the connection between the athletic activity and artistic expression. Yeah, yeah. The whole idea kind of started when I was rewatching um, Pumping Iron, the old Arnold documentary. And I was like, these guys are oh. hilarious. They're smoking joints on Venice Beach and yeah. chasing girls around and looking superhuman. I got to see that. Yeah. Oh, it's <laughs> so good. It's like. I heard it's a good film. I mean, Arnold's just <laughs> charisma in that movie is so undeniable. <laughs> like, he's just a nobody 25-year-old bodybuilder, but you can already tell now, like, it just makes every bit of sense that he'd become the biggest star in the world. He's fucking hilarious. Yeah. Every scene. He bullies the other guys. He's cocky. He's like, has, he explains his psychological warfare technique for winning bodybuilding shows. It's it's like a phenomenal work of art in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, he's great. He's, he's hilarious. Definitely funny. There's this one part where he, um, they ask him what he likes about training so much. And he's like, are you kidding me? The pump is, it's better than coming. It's like I'm coming in the morning and coming at night. I'm coming all day. Who wouldn't love to come like that? <laughs> And he says it so <laughs> sort of like stone sober that it's mind blowing. Yeah. Like doesn't even understand the absurdity of what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, he, 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 no one can ever say, I'll be back again. <laughs> that no. simple three word sentence. <laughs> it belongs I'll, to I'll him, be back. the governor. Period. <laughs> I mean, and God, I fucking love that movie too. People don't give him it like he's obviously not a very skilled actor. He just like fits into these roles so fucking well. And the camera just you can't take your eyes yeah. off of him because he's so striking to look at. Um Yeah. You never did you ever do any acting? I was curious about that. Um, a little bit. Uh like when I was in school. Um, I actually, the project that uh, Paul Gondry and Elise Raven and um, and Paul Lemaire and Shal, yeah. they're working on this 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 film, uh, Spoogle, I think it's called, Spurgle. I can't oh, yeah, remember. Chronicles I can't of Spongle. You're in a scene with my friend Bradford. Yeah, I'm, I think I, as a scene where I'm vomiting. Yes. And then there's a scene when I get into a fight fight with these guys and this guy beats the crap out of me yeah 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 so the guy who beats the crap out of you is the director of my music video who i was referring to before oh wow excellent so excellent all these uh <laughs> connections here and there um well they, elise had asked me if they needed a, a guy to be like an old an old man in this uh this place and uh where all these people are you know, addicted to this substance. And I don't really know the story of it. I don't think I, had he, I don't even think Paul knows the and, story. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it was brilliant. What they were doing was was really fun. And yeah. yeah. Uh, they took a house, they transformed this house into this zone of of just incomprehensible I, I, I couldn't comprehend what it is that it was, but it made complete sense. And it had stuff on the walls and it was beautiful, really beautiful. And so they asked me to uh, to make up some lines. So I just started improvising some lines with uh, with Charles, who was supposed to have been uh, playing my son. And I just who said it was just fun. And then they 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 said, so we need someone to vomit. Any volunteers in a vomit scene? <laughs> so I raised my hand and I said, I used to vomit in uh, a lot when my brothers and I made films when I was twelve. So <laughs> I, I would. You knew how to do it on again. demand. Yeah, my brothers and I used to make films when we were we were young, and we used to make, of course, violent films with a lot of violence and throwing up and all kinds of Super 8 cameras, and 
so I, I'm in a vomit scene, and then there's another scene where I get beaten up. <laughs> so amazing. But it was fun. That's that's the most of my acting. Uh, that's pretty much the highlight of my acting career. <laughs> I mean, I kind of act in my, I make a lot of rock uh, rock videos. I, I make a lot of videos. I have my own YouTube station. And um, so I have a lot of videos on there, right? I, I guess I'm kind of acting, but uh, I always I wanted to, but I was never in a situation that, you know, I could never, I never went on an audition or I never joined any kind of, a, you know, actors. I never took classes in acting. So, but it would be fun. Yeah. I've been, I just, uh, I'm just just curious because I've been writing a lot for theater. Um, I did a play that I wrote in LA uh, and then we did a staging here. Um, I didn't really act in that, but I took the position of narrator where I'm sort of like telling the story as it's unfolding in the background. And then, oh, wow. And then I wrote a new play that's going to be the first of a four part series where, that that's set in again professional bodybuilding because i find it to be just such a weird fascinating drug addled world uh where (laughs) i will be playing uh, a bodybuilder who gets injured the day before his big show and then finds Uh. out his girlfriend has been having a long-term affair with one of his competitors so um oh man yeah so i'm excited Uh. to do that one but i was thinking maybe if you ever want to come out and do a play or something I could probably find a role for you in one of these things. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'd love to do that. <laughs> Fantastic. I have experience in front of a camera. <laughs> yeah, if I have a puking character, I, I know who to call anyways. <laughs> uh, anyway, Stephen, this was a really fantastic conversation, and I, I can't appreciate your time enough. Well, thank you so much, Adam. It was a great pleasure to talk to you. It was very nice to meet you at the at the opening, and and thanks for. Uh, and I look forward to. Uh, I look forward to hearing your music too, and and uh, and it, all the. You mentioned um, I couldn't find a link to your. You mentioned that you had a, a, a uh, you had a, a new song video, but I couldn't find it. So you have to oh, send the me the performance video. Are. Yeah, I'll send you the link to the performance mm-hmm. video, and I'll send you the link to that Conor McGregor thing I just wrote. All right. <laughs> um, All right. yeah this was this was really spectacular and it was such a treat to see you perform and um, perform mm-hmm. at your show and all that oh thank you thanks it was it was it was it was a nice event fantastic yeah. all right Stephen. thank you so much and i'll talk to you soon i'll shoot you an email right now okay great uh, thank you thank you very much adam it was really nice to talk to you have a great night right. you too